democracy and freedom are values that are lengthily fought for, but rapidly lost if we stop thinking critically. In the hearts and minds of people, Crimea has always been and remains an integral part of Russia. The German population of the Sudetenland has been and remains German. Millions of Russians are living and are going to live in Ukraine, and Russia will always protect their interests. More than a million people with German blood found themselves abroad from their homeland. To achieve this, they will strive to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. Our stories begin at the moment of our birth. This time all of us are equal, but not for long. In this house in Austria, a baby is born. And his parents do not know yet that he will become the most famous ruler of the 20th century. He will make history. It is the fruit of the love between Clara Hitler and her uncle. The newborn will be named Adolf. He is a future dictator. I came into this world not to make people better, but to exploit their weaknesses. And here we go with another birth. This baby will be named Vladimir. Vladimir will make history also known as a dictator. And as the first president in history to be issued an arrest warrant by the International Court of Justice. Vladimir Putin is the one who wants to rewrite history, but virtually he is just going to get caught in it. He is just a swindler. He only drinks his red wine. Two worlds, two destinies, 66 years between them gaining power, 66 years between attempts to create a third Rome. Whether a person becomes a dictator depends on whether the society in which they live allows them to become a dictator or not. This requires a population that is afraid of its own shadow. Atomized people are unable to unite, not just in political parties, but in groups of three being on the street, as it is in Russia. Therefore, they are unable to resist the totalitarian dictatorship that is inching its way and taking away their rights and freedoms. Putin and Hitler were growing up without proper love. Both Adolf and Vladimir were often subjected to severe punishment from their parents. I had the most important sin. I was surrounded by my parents' love. They loved me. I knew it. I felt it. In fact, this is a lie. Putin senior used to often beat Vladimir. Putin's father served in a punitive battalion of the NKVD and therefore he considered physical violence to be the norm. He was a rather cruel and harsh man, almost a domestic tyrant. Therefore, if you want your child to grow up as a natural, normal, mentally healthy person, you should think about whether it is a good idea to beat your children. Relationships with peers were extremely difficult as well. Both boys were beaten, not accepted in the children's group and called names. For example, Putin was called cigarette butt. Once he drew a cat turned backwards to everyone, similar to that cat he wanted to turn his own back to everyone, to hide his secrets. I saw with my own eyes several drawings of Putin from his so-called workbooks. From the point of view of psychoanalysis, there are usual manifestations of psychopathy there. There are several markers that indicate the presence of psychopathic traits, egocentrism, egoism, not seeing anyone around but himself. Keep it as a memento. Adolf also painted. And if Putin liked the art of minimalism, Hitler was a landscape painter. But Hitler senior wanted his son to imitate him in everything and become a customs officer. But Adi was against this and he was severely punished for it. He was beaten and he ran away to the monastery choir and served their pastor during mass. 
It was a strict, rigid upbringing at the level of discipline with elements of training. That is, no sentimentals, no emotionally deep relationships. No, it was a brutal upbringing, soldiers' upbringing, so to speak. This was the doctrine of the pedagogy of the time. Such upbringing traumatizes the personality, it neutralizes it. But despite his reticence, Putin had always wanted to appear as a chicky street tough guy, dangerous, cunning and infinitely strong. 50 years ago, the streets in Leningrad taught me one rule. If a fight is inevitable, you have to beat first. Not to forget it was Putin who was beaten in the majority of cases. That's why he joined the Sambo section and later he even became a champion of Leningrad all for the sole purpose of taking revenge on everyone who had ever offended him in any way. Oppressed, unloved boys learned from an early age that violence is the norm every man for himself. The main thing is to survive. To avoid being beaten, children try to constantly lie and manipulate in order to achieve a specific goal. That is, to avoid being beaten. Constant lying and manipulations give a child confidence and even conviction that this is a norm of behavior. After his father's death, Adolf painted constantly, but in vain. Hitler's art didn't receive recognition, he was twice rejected at the exams at the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. Hitler, in fact, had very weak portraits and, well, I would even say they were really bad. This is due to two factors. First of all, Adolf Hitler did not like people, not only as an individual level, he did not like mankind in general. Secondly, he was a bad student, he had no ability to learn. He didn't know anatomy, the laws of portrait construction or portraiture in general. But Vladimir Putin chose a different path, following in the footsteps of his father and also his grandfather, Spiridon Ivanovich Putin. Is it true that your grandfather knew Lenin? Yes, he worked as a cook for him. First for Lenin, then for Stalin. At one of the cottage houses in the Moscow region, in Gorky. His grandfather was no ordinary cook, he was a Czechist cook. Otherwise, he would not have been allowed to the table of the leaders, especially Stalin who was paranoid and deathly afraid of being poisoned. It's hard to believe it, but Spiridon Ivanovich outlived Lenin and Stalin and never even fell under the flywheel of repression. Perhaps this laid the foundation of Putin's love for charismatic chefs. In his last years, my grandfather worked in Ilinsky, where the Moscow City Committee of the Communist Party had a rest home. He worked there, and after retirement, he lived there, on that territory. There was a small apartment there, and he lived there. When studying, Volodya Putin could not help but mention Czechist Spiridon Putin, who was Lenin and Stalin's cook. And this gave him a chance, a chance to enter the committee. In his fourth year at Leningrad University, he became an unofficial KGB informant, having got the call sign Moth. I think that we know very little about that real Putin, who he used to be, about his entire family, and we will probably find out about this if the archives are opened and preserved when the period of secrecy of these materials expires. So, if you have a neighbor who paints pictures, if he is a sambo wrestler and his grandfather is a former KGB officer, you get a potential dictator. Hitler and Putin belong to the same psychological type. This is psychopathy combined with sadism, which is combined with narcissism. This is a dark triad. These people are capable of self-discipline, and in everyday life they generally behave according to social conventions. That is, in such a way as not to stand out among others. But they are waiting for their time to come. And when it comes, then this whole triad, this whole bouquet, sadism, narcissism, psychopathy, begins to show its real face.
a charismatic speaker can turn out to be a priest of destructive church and kill hundreds of people. He can steamroll cities with thousands of dwellers, unleash a world war and drown millions of people in blood. After graduation, Putin joins the 5th Department of the Leningrad KGB, where, according to his words, he filled some cases. This semi-criminal slang phrase is difficult to understand whether he was referring to folders or whether he was actually carrying out punitive tasks against dissidents. During the Soviet Union, there was an elite administration. The most interesting, intelligent and promising people were hired there. But Putin could not work there. And he was fired for being underqualified. His service in KGB gave Putin another great advantage. He was discharged from the military service. He shamelessly changed this page of his biography, falsely telling journalists not only that he had served, but that he had served in the Marine Corps. Such specialists are trained by the Marines. Putin. Putin is the kind of person who has to lie because this is the essence of his mindset. He began to realize himself as a Tsarist type of person which is inherent in the Russian Federation. It doesn't matter if you call him the general secretary, the president or the Tsar, but it's always the Tsar anyway. And at that moment he lost control over what he was saying. Hitler was also a long-time draft dodger, hiding behind his grandfather's last name, Schickelgruber. On August 1, 1914, Germany declared war on Russia. And Hitler received the news with enthusiasm and went to the front. From the very beginning, he was neither a patriot, nor Hitler, nor a Nazi. He was an ordinary person, a guy who wanted to live. And uh, he joined the army when he simply could not escape it. It wasn't done by choice. Later, they made a nice image out of it. In October 1918, his regiment suffered from a gas attack. Hitler lost his eyesight for a while and was hospitalized until the end of the war. At that time, he was concerned about two things. Whether he would ever be able to paint again and whether the rumors that the German monarchy would soon fall were true. On November 9th, 1918, the Republic was declared in Germany. The monarchy fell. After the First World War, he plunged into politics, exchanging his brush for a tribune. Throughout his entire life, he kept adapting to the public in a very ingenious way. He manipulated the fears, horrors, stigmas, stereotypes, perceptions and banalities of the Germans of that time. He wrote only about things he could gain ground with and nothing more. In order to be able to think more critically, let's move our attention to the mid-1970s in the United States. This is an experiment that gives us an understanding of how manipulation works, the experiment of Dr. Fox. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Fox. I have several scientific degrees, so everything you're going to hear today is important. As a part of the experiment, an actor with no scientific background was invited to give a lecture with unclear meaning on humanitarian ethology to a group of students. The lecture was full of strange and meaningless phrases, but it was presented in such an authoritative and convincing manner that the students evaluated the lecture highly, despite its incomprehensible content. I believe that those tons of information that we have processed is the most important basis for your further medical practice. 
This experiment proved that if information is meaningless, the way it is presented can have a significant influence on the perception of this information. It all comes down to two technologies. The first is a monopoly. There should be a non-competitive monopoly. That is, there should be no internal discussion. And the second technology is scaling up bullshit to the maximum, so to speak. And the main goal is total domination through fear. In 1984, after receiving the rank of major, Putin was sent to the Moscow Higher KGB Academy, where he chose his own telling nickname. When I was studying at the Intelligence Academy, I had the nickname Platov. Everyone had a nickname. We had to do work that required a certain level of secrecy. Platov is probably a contraction of the nickname Suda Platov, referring to the famous Soviet spy, saboteur and murderer of Yevgen Konovalet. However, Putin failed to gain the same fame as a dangerous intelligence officer. Instead of espionage adventures, Major Putin received a resolution of unsuitability for service and was sent to Dresden. Putin is a true Germanophile. He spent many years in the GDR. And of course, he observed what was happening in the German Democratic Republic, the Stasi and all that. This was the year that was inspiring him. I believe that a lot of these neo-Nazi, revenge-seeking and other sentiments remained in his mind. This is what we see now in Russia, all that mysticism and symbolism, all these letters V and Z. Having spent several years at the Dresden Club, Putin made a U-turn in his life. In 1990, he joins the team of Anatoly Sobchak, the head of the Leningrad City Council, and enters politics on his shoulders. Sobchak needed someone with international experience, because he had none. Sobchak was just an ordinary lawyer. But there had to be someone who could be trusted, and this relation to the KGB was the criterion for why this person could be trusted. The collapse of the USSR and of the entire vertical system of power was going on right before Putin's eyes. Just as the defeat in the war was a personal insult to Hitler, the collapse of the USSR was a personal tragedy for Putin. I keep insisting that this is a tragedy. As a result of the collapse of the USSR, 25 million ethnic Russians found themselves abroad. Hitler felt emotions, Putin did not. He couldn't offer something more modern, up-to-date, and so he appealed to the youth of certain people. When they had hopes for the better, they don't remember that it was hard for them then. Too, and they didn't have much wealth. But at the same time, he brought back this edge Soviet mythology and gave it to them because he couldn't think of anything else. 1990. In one of Munich's pubs, Hitler managed to demonstrate his elegance so that he was invited to join the German Workers' Party. The National Socialist Party had no actual agenda and consisted of these inventions, myths and fairy tales which Hitler learned to present in a very pathetic, beautiful, I would even say stylish way for his time. In 1923, after a failed coup that went down in history as the Beer Hall Putsch, Hitler was sent to prison. Having taken a paper and a pen, Hitler writes Mein Kampf there. In his book, he advocates the establishment of a dictatorial regime in Germany, military expansion, and the seizure of a living space in Eastern Europe. 
Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, was a book about the inner world of a person who sincerely believed in it. Putin is a copyist, he has nothing inside him, he is a characterless man, Chekhov's man in a case. For the rest of his life he will be writing a speech asking for forgiveness for the Hague Tribunal. This is the only consequence and heritage that Putin will leave after him. Putin could hypothetically go to prison just as well. In the 90s, the city on the Neva was drowning in criminal clashes, corruption and racketeering. And in the swamp, Putin felt like a fish in the sea. From the very beginning, Putin had relations with the criminal world. And from the very beginning, this was the main focus of his activity. Putin was the unofficial mayor of St. Petersburg. Everyone knew this. And all issues in St. Petersburg had to be resolved with Putin, not with Sobchak. Putin ruled St. Petersburg. But somehow the real master of St. Petersburg decided to become the master of the Kremlin. Sobchak wanted to run for president of Russia. Yeltsin got to know about this. Sobchak lost the 1996 mayoral elections in St. Petersburg and saved his life by a miracle. It is not a secret that each of these politicians had a person close to them who was connected to the shadow world of the special services. That was exactly the role Putin played. Putin went to work in Moscow. In the administrative directory of the president of the Russian Federation, he joins the system which Sobchak was fighting against. Goodbye. Putin was transferred to the administrative directory to the president of the Russian Federation, and this was the most well-paid position, because everything was covered there. It was about building and managing the real estate that's in the administration's circle, and all that. So there was money to be made. From that moment on, Putin's stunning career began. In 1997, he becomes deputy head of the presidential administration and head of the presidential control directorate. 1998, director of the Federal Security Service. 1999, prime minister of the government of the Russian Federation. For me, returning to work in the security services is like coming back home. Putin, Putin came to power as a transitional phase who no one had any long-term hopes for. But the main role in this was played by something that no one could have really forecasted. The population liked him. The population loved him beyond belief. A long-term system with mechanisms of resistance and punishment can become an incubator for growing up a dictator out of anyone who shows loyalty and fear of it. Therefore, the future requires opposition to such systems through direct democracy, the rule of law and the protection of human rights. If a person remains loyal to Putin, Putin is also loyal to them. And this is one of the forces that explains why this vertical power in Russia is so strong. He restored the Soviet nomenclature. And all people know that if they don't betray Putin, he will always find them some position that they can live off again and make money. After his release from prison, Hitler further strengthened his authority among the masses, acting as the main fighter against the communists and the Jews. Germany was hypnotized by Hitler's diabolic charisma. He skillfully manipulated the masses by exploiting the resentment of the Germans for their defeat in World War I and the humiliating Treaty of Versailles, according to which Germany paid heavy reparations and lost their rule area. 
Hitler, uh, Hitler took advantage not only of this catastrophe, he further parathetized on the depression that began in the 1930s. And after being in power for several years, he did virtually nothing to overcome this depression within the country. His task was to parathetize on the problems of the life of every German family and to turn Germans into bloodthirsty monsters who were willing and able to destroy first the Jews and then everyone else for the sake of their imaginary and beautiful future. Hitler is the Chancellor of the Reich. He has only two ministerial portfolios out of 11 and his opponents are sure that Hitler will fail. But it didn't turn out that way. On February 27, 1933, the German parliament, the Reichstag, caught fire and the remnants of democracy burned in it. Hitler used the arson of the Reichstag in order to concentrate all available levers in his hands and uh, turn terror against his opponents, against the political opponents, into an event that was understandable to ordinary Germans. And after a few years of such a policy, there were no enemies left. In 1934, the SS guards under Himmler's leadership finally cleared the political field around the Führer by organizing the bloody Night of the Long Knives. The assassinated about 200 of Hitler's rivals, he proclaimed himself the Führer of the German people. He was turning people into completely intellectually disabled fanatics, into those who, when Soviet troops entered, simply took their own lives on benches in parks, along with their children. Because if there is no Führer, there is no Reich. If you inch your way as a dictator, you have to be consistent. FSB director Putin wanted his own pet security wing in 1998, he creates the Special Operations Center, merging Alpha anti terrorism, Vimpol, professional saboteurs, and the SOD, Special Operations Directorate, into one institution. The regions were autonomous enough, they had enough influences. They did not recognize Putin as a leader, as a person who could give any orders. This vague figure had to be made into a leader, to inflate his visibility through unprecedented steps, such as explosions in Russia itself. It is this structure that is credited with the bombings of houses in Moscow and other Russian cities. Bloodletting, like the inflow of new blood, is always a useful process. It was very important for Putin, because he had to look inside the country, inside Russia, like an alpha male, like a leader, like a winner. On December 31, 1999, President Yeltsin announces his resignation in his New Year's Eve address to the nation and appoints Putin as his successor. Today, on the last day of the outgoing century, I resign. In March 2000, Putin was elected president of the Russian Federation. The main request of Yeltsin and his family was to protect them personally and their assets. And they needed a person who would be powerful and loyal. That's one of the very important things about Putin. His loyalty, his willingness to live by concepts. 
So there are two parallel realities, 66 years separate two historical events, the emergence of two dictators in power, power for which they will fight to the death. I swear to respect and protect human and civil rights and freedoms in the exercise of my powers as president of the Russian Federation to follow and protect the Constitution of the Russian Federation. Hindenburg and Yeltsin were very alike. Mighty bears, old apparatchiks, and they were replaced by microscopic, insecure successors from whom no one expected such a vigor. We will end them in a toilet. That's it, matter closed. What put me so blatant in his statements and actions? If Hitler had sat on the dock in Nuremberg, if the world had succeeded in bringing the 20th century dictator to justice? Well, this is an open question. In order to reflect, you need to have some empathy which Putin does not have. He does not realize that someone will have to pay off. He has no chance of ending the war without defeat, and he will not end it, realizing this until he loses everything. It took Putin almost five years to clear the political field. Oligarch Berezovsky, NTV, and other independent media were the first to fall under the repression. If we restore order with a firm hand, we will all live better, more comfortably and safely. Putin was not in a hurry to shed blood. He acted more cunningly. He deprived his opponents of the platform to speak, expelled them from the country and branded them as traitors and enemies of the people. And only in the last resort did he take extreme measures, assassination. You have to move forward without forgetting the rear. The most high-profile murders were those of Anna Politkovskaya and Boris Nemtsov. Nemtsov was symbolically shot dead right in front of the Kremlin walls. I am against the war. I don't want Cargo 200 to come to us. I don't want our mothers, our wives and children to cry. It's mean, it's insolent. As for Boris Nemtsov, I believe that this murder is directly related to Ukraine. Some kind of sacrificial victim, as Putin calls it, was needed. This is a person who is very famous in the West, and from the very beginning Moscow wanted to blame Ukraine for this murder. Every war requires enormous efforts and resources, so both Putin and Hitler began to adjust industries to the war economy mode, strengthen the country's vigor, implement economic laws, shape a nation and be a father to it. Germany cooperated with the Soviet Union for a long time and received weapons from there because the Soviet Union was preparing for a world war against the global capitalism and it was convenient for the Soviet Union to help revive the military power of Germany without any unnecessary noise, because it had pinned its hopes on it as its future partner during the first stage of the war. Fulfilling his promises to the people, Hitler unilaterally broke the Treaty of Versailles, causing a loud scandal in the League of Nations. In due time, Putin will also disregard the Budapest Memorandum, international treaties, conventions and the UN Charter. But that will come later. For now, he's focused on ensuring that the country reaps huge profits from oil and gas sales, putting all of Europe on the energy needle. We have gas in our apartment. And you? You have it too. And you will have it. But it can become much cheaper if we agree to work together in an honest matter. The world was never tired of admiring new progressive politicians and reformers 
Both of them became People of the Year, according to the authoritative Time magazine. Hitler in 1938, a year before the outbreak of World War II. And Putin in 2007, a year before the invasion of Georgia. Both Hitler and Putin invented their own spiritual staples, religious nonsense based on the most absurd ideas. The less understandable, the better. The most important matter here is for people to believe in them. The essence of these ideologies, both the Nazism and Russism, is to confuse a human being so that they do not understand who is right, who is to blame, why they live so badly, what are the reasons. And the main thing is to not to look for them in themselves, to teach a person to be a beast, to bring them back to a state of these wild Vikings who, after drinking a decoction of a fly agaric, went to slaughter anyone they met on their way and didn't understand what they were doing and why. Communist ideology is very similar to Christianity, in fact. Freedom, brotherhood, equality. Justice, all this is in the holy book. It is all there. Just look, Lenin was put in a mausoleum. How is this different from the relics of saints for Orthodox Christians and for Christians in general? In their turn, Russians pray in front of church icons, worship communist leaders, and have made May 9th a sacred holiday of tanks, bombs, and general hatred of the past. This is a concept of the so-called Russian people. They can only exist in a vacuum. They cannot exist in a competitive environment. They are not the descendants of European civilization, but of a nomadic one. They want to live like that. They are barbarians of the classical type. Cargo cult, intertwining beliefs and ideological delusions are signs of dictatorial influence that clutter the mind with illusions. Critical thinking is the antidote. Hit the center of decision-making. Hit Washington, Sarmat. Strike the enemy's cities. Hit Washington. Having established total control and turned the population into a submissive herd, Hitler and Putin moved from theory to practice. Hitler sends troops into the Saarland region and the Rhine demilitarized zone, which were lost by Germany after World War I. And Putin attacked Georgia. We have seen a provocation that totally imitates Russian technologies, which they also copied from Hitler's Germany. It was easier for Russia to manipulate internal contradictions in states that were just getting back on their feet and where the central government was not yet so strong. And it was with the help of such hybrid influences that Russia tried to destabilize the situation inside. One of the most important reasons for these aggressive actions of the dictators was to test the reaction of the world. The world's reaction turned out to be weak. Hitler was condemned by the League of Nations, Putin by the United Nations, and that's all. The collective Putin's task was to return Russia to the totalitarian past. In 2014, they embarked on a path of a total conservative reversal. They tested their population, the population confirmed this totalitarian consensus, and that was it. Then the system went downhill. Having satisfied their predatory ambitions for a while, Hitler and Putin decided to play the role of peacemakers again, and in order to regain the affection of the world community, they organized a grand celebration of reconciliation, the Olympic Games. I welcome the competition in Berlin. 
I declare celebration of the 11th Olympic Games open. I declare the 22nd Winter Olympic Games in Sochi opened. Both Germany and Russia won their own Olympics, but it was not a victory for athletes, but a triumph for dictators. The Sochi Olympics took place 14 kilometers from occupied Georgia. While Russian troops were landing in Crimea under the cover of so-called Little Green Man. Everyone believed that we were in the zone of Russia's interests, so no one interfered. The Russian Federation was actively integrated, it was perceived as a partner, and it was certainly allowed to dominate the space. Why? Because in 1991, instead of building an independent state, we were still somewhere in the middle. After the Olympic Games, the Führers finally took off their masks and revealed their real faces. It is possible to return to totalitarianism in our country for a certain period. Hitler annexed Austria. Putin annexed Crimea. The German Führer occupied a part of Czechoslovakia and the Russian Führer targeted Donbass, ignoring the Budapest Memorandum. We have not signed any binding documents with this state and in relation to this state. He intended to simply pass through Ukraine, do the same sin as in 1939, and then threaten the rest of Europe. After Azov and our volunteer battalions inflicted a significant defeat on the Russians, precisely those Russian regular units that were brought into Ukraine, the Russians discovered that Ukraine is actually stronger than they used to think. Hitler relied on a blitzkrieg. In the war, similarly, Putin planned to capture Kiev in two or three days. We just need to look at them, and Ukraine will understand everything. We'll capture Kyiv. This is a historical train, it's already running. You can stand there and slow it down, but it will definitely reach the final. And in this final, Russia does not exist in this form, because Russia will never be a modern country. It will never be a democratic country, and it will take time for the world to rebuild its system of protection against inadequate countries. Germany and Russia have a common history, I know that for sure. It seems to me that we have no right not only to forget about it, but it is high time to recall it. This is the apogee of the new Russian religion, the Temple of the Armed Forces. Some of the main exhibits in it are Hitler's military jacket and cap. Experts say that the Führer's uniform was bought at a black auction for a lot of money on Putin's personal order. Everyone who comes here will remember past acts of heroism and prepare for future ones. It is inconceivable that Hitler's jacket and cap could actually be brought to the temple, that is, the house of a living God, and even put it down there. This means turning this temple into a heathen thane. And what function does this cap have? Is it an icon? What about the icons of Stalin next to it? Sacred relics of the saints of the cult of the Holy Rus? So then the question is, who is the god here? He is a mentally ill person. What he needs are doctors, nurses, injections from morning till night. He wants to rule us forever until Russia dies. The stories of Hitler and Putin are the stories of a potential artist and a samba wrestler who, unfortunately, 
became bloody dictators responsible for the genocide of millions. To prevent the birth of Führer 3.0, the world must first unite all the efforts and overthrow this one. Secondly, it must conduct a demonstrative, public, global trial over this particular Putin and over the collective Putin. The world must eliminate the formula of creating both idols and ideals. There must be a strong global law enforcement system and severe punishment for specific criminal offenses, no more, no less. The whole world should be Ukrainian, the only great Ukrainian. The two Führers are separated in time by 66 years, when they gained absolute power. History has drawn enough parallel lines. It is time to put an end to them. One of them had the courage to take his own life, but Putin, a pathological coward, must sit on the dock. <laughs>